The Bible reading this morning comes from 1 Corinthians 18 to 31. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, the intelligent of the intelligent, the intelligence of the intelligent will I will frustrate. Where is the wise person? Where is the teacher of the law? And where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know him. But God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. Jews demanded signs and Greeks looked for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews and foolishness to the Gentiles. But to those who God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. Brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of the world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are, so that no one may boast before him. It is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus, who has become for us wisdom from God, that is our righteousness, holiness and redemption. Therefore, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. Good morning. It's nice to see so many brothers and sisters here today. The brothers and sisters from Windsor greet you. Stephen, they send a special greeting to you as well. As Paul began this letter, uh, I'd like to begin by saying grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Amen. Uh, it's my privilege to open God's Word with you this morning, and I invite you, if you have a Bible or your smartphone, pull it out, uh, follow along on the screen. Uh, we're going to be continuing where Stephen started last week through the first letter that we have from Paul to the church at Corinth. Uh, in your Bibles, it's called 1 Corinthians. And we'll be looking at verses 18 to 31 today, which is a very appropriate passage for this occasion. Before we begin, I just uh, want to affirm for you, I want, to hear, I want you to hear these words out of my mouth. As someone who's had the privilege of walking with Stephen uh, for the last decade or so, give or take, uh, I want to affirm uh, that I believe this is a man that God has gifted and called uh, to be a lead pastor in his church. And so I encourage you to support him as such. Uh, I heard my name a fair bit this morning, which is, which is a bit awkward. And um, I want to, not out of awkwardness, but I want to, just so you're clear, anything good that you see in Stephen, any sort of fruit it is solely attributed to the way that he has opened his heart and his mind to the Word of God and allowed God to change him. Full stop. With that, I invite you to pray with me. Father in heaven, we come before you now again, confessing as we've just sung that Jesus is magnificent 
that your grace is what we need. And so, Lord, as we come to the scriptures this morning, we pray that the Holy Spirit would be our teacher. We pray that he would apply to our hearts and minds the truth that we lack, the truth that we don't find in ourselves or in this world, and that only comes from you. We ask this in Christ's name and for his glory. Amen. I want to begin today with the question of where is wisdom found? Where do you find wisdom? Now, I don't, you may think, I haven't really thought about that. You know, it's not really relevant to me. Don't you find wisdom wherever you want to get it? I mean, that's sort of what we do today. You know, somebody asks you, what's a good TV show? I don't know. What do you like? Somebody says, where's a good restaurant? You say, I don't know. What do you like? Somebody says, where do you find wisdom? We often think, oh, well, what's wisdom to you? That's not the Bible's view of what wisdom is. Wisdom is not is not something that people have within them. It's not something that they can access through the recesses of their mind. And also importantly, it's not something that you can go out into the world or into the marketplace and simply pick up at the shops on your way home. True wisdom comes from God. And Paul is talking to a church, a group of believers in Corinth who are seeing mighty manifestations of the presence and the power of God, but they're starting to get confused about where that power comes from. And as they hear people and observe people ministering among them, they begin to develop an appetite for the particular ministry and style that the way these people have served them. And before long, factions begin to develop. And Stephen talked to you last week about the banners. You know, whose whose banner are you coming under? Are you coming under Paul's banner? Are you coming under Peter's banner? And so the church is beginning to divide over this cult of personality because they, they find themselves infatuated with the way certain people are bringing God's grace to them. And they're forgetting that the true power and the true wisdom is already theirs in Christ. And so it's very fitting for me to open this text with you this morning that we would all, include myself in this, we would all collectively be reminded where true wisdom is found and where the power of salvation actually lies. Paul gives it to you straight away. Verse 18, for the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved... It is the power of God. Someone comes up to you on the street. Oh boy, I just just need to feel supernatural power. I just need to feel, I, I I need to access the supernatural. I need to access the spiritual. What do you do? My first thought might be to say, well, okay, let's pray. Because, you know, as a Christian, I can pray, I can, I, I can talk to God, and, I, and I'm going to ask God to sort of zap you right now, so you can feel the power of God. Or I might say, you know, here, here, here's a Christian practice, you know, and, and, if, and if we do the practice, you're fine. Paul says, tell him Jesus died for your sins on the cross. You've just unleashed the power of God. Now, I can tell... By the way, some of you are looking at me. You're like, really? Really? Notice, Paul doesn't say the cross is the power of God unto salvation, although it affects salvation. Listen to what he says. The message of the cross. The message of the cross is the power of God unto salvation for all who are being saved. That's why Paul's not ashamed of it. Paul's been in Corinth. You may recall before he he landed in Corinth, he spent some time in Athens talking with, you know, all the muckety mucks. You know, he was in, you know, he was in the tech circles, and he's he's rubbing shoulders with the elite, and and they're talking, and Paul's interacting with all these philosophers, and he shows up in Corinth, and and when he arrives in Corinth, he's alone and he's weak. Now, Paul has had some mighty experiences, but when he walked into Corinth, he was not on the feeling at the top of his game. In fact, he says, all I could communicate to you was Jesus Christ and him crucified. That's all. And the power of God was unleashed in this community.
Stephen, as you accept your post today, this truth, this truth is one that is absolutely crucial that you hold dear. It is precisely because the message of the cross is polarizing that we're tempted to leave it behind. We're tempted to stop talking to people about a, a, a bleeding Messiah on a tree over two millennia ago. Can't you give me something new? Can't you give me something I can do? Can't you give me a crystal? Can't you give me uh, uh, an oil? Can't you give me, can't you give me something that will, will unlock this divine power? And Paul says, the message of the cross is foolishness. People leave it behind. Those are the people, the Bible says, are in process of perishing. And by perishing, I don't mean the bread that's growing moldy in your basket on the kitchen bench. They're in process of meeting their destruction. But to those who believe, it's the power of God. Now, you might say, why? Why would this be the thing? Paul tells you in verse 19, for it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, the intelligence of the intelligent I will frustrate. The reason that God chooses to show his power through the foolishness of this message is because he wanted to. Because he wanted to thumb his nose at all of humanity's supposed cleverness. He wanted to look at our collective wisdom like that people who gathered at the Tower of Babel to say, we're going to build a tower up to heaven because God, we think if we work hard enough and long enough and we talk about it long enough, we can actually get there. So God, we're on our way. God says he chose this message to be the means of conveying his power because he is determined to thumb his nose at human wisdom. If you come to God in pride, you know he's going to work against you. If you're brashly walking into God's office and slamming your agenda down on his desk and saying, God, it's about time you started getting this going. It's about time this started happening. Or, as we're going to see in a minute, well, God, if you're real, you would do this for me. If you were true, you would do this for me. If there was real power in Jesus Christ, then I would see this. What is that? That's right. So Paul tells him straight away, he says, hearing the message of the cross, it's going to produce different results. Stephen, if you preach the message of the cross, if that defines your ministry, you will see the power of God, but you will also see people walk away. You will not bar, bar a, a revival of the Holy Spirit, you will not see the crowds gather. And if there are scores who are coming to believe, it will only be because of a work of the Spirit. Because you won't be able to go back and say, well, wasn't that a great sermon? Did you see what I did with those slides? <laughs> Hearing the message of the cross produces different results. In verses 20 to 25, Paul sort of takes a side turn and he dives into this question of, human wisdom, and here he speaks about seeking the wisdom of this age. Listen to what he says. Paul begins with a summons. He says, where is the wise person? You guys seen that meme of Will Smith from Fresh Prince of Bel-Air? You seen that one? Maybe not. I spend too much time online. I'm sorry. There's this meme of Will Smith from the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air when all the family moves out and he's standing there alone in the living room and he's looking around. That's like Paul in this passage. He's saying, where's the wise person? Where is this teacher of the law? Where is the philosopher of this age? Notice Paul says there's two ages. There's the age that's now and the age that, that is come and is coming. Paul says, where are these smart people? They're not seeing the power of God. For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know him, God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. Don't get it twisted. It simply happens when you preach about Jesus Christ dying on the cross for people's sins, God turns the light on. 
There's an awakening that happens in people's hearts and they begin to think, would God really do that for me? Yes, he would. Would God love me that much that he would not spare his own son, but would give him over, that he would take the punishment that I deserve, that as Peter writes, he would bear in his body my sins upon the tree. You see, we think, well, look, I might sacrifice myself for a really noble person or, or someone who, you know, has more potential than I do, but, but would you sacrifice yourself for your enemy? For the person whose very existence is set against yours? The person who rebels and rejects everything you stand for? The person who's trying to undermine you and everything? Would you die for that person? God did. Because he died for me. And he died for you. And we're just saying, Jesus paid it all on the cross. That's what God chooses. He does this because he wants them to know that it's not their power or cleverness that saves people. Listen to the different reactions to this. Verse 22, Jews demand signs and Greeks look for wisdom. Now, the Jews were a religious people. Absolutely. They had the scriptures. They had the old covenant. What's going on here? The Jews said, I believe in a Messiah, but, but here's how the Messiah is going to come. It's got to look like this. And so what they do is they lay their own template, their own framework, their own grid, their own box. And they say, Jesus, we need you to tick this box. This is what the Gospels are full of. And Jesus is just throwing away their template left, right, and center. He's just, just throw, chuck that out. That's rubbish. Just rip that up. No, no, no. You think you know the scriptures, you don't really know the scriptures. If you knew the scriptures, you would know this is what the Messiah has to do. This is, this is what I have to do. I have to suffer rejection and die. But the Jews of Jesus' day, they said, you know, they're like kids in the street playing music. Come on, Jesus, dance. Do what we want you to do. Kick the Romans out. Flex your muscles, Jesus. Zap us with that superpower. Then we'll believe you're the Messiah. I was in a Bible study last week, and for the first time, it hit me that Jesus, as he's on the cross, this is in Luke's gospel, Jesus, as he's on the cross, he gets taunted three times, three times from the crowd. And each time, it's the same thing. If you are the Messiah, get down from the cross. Who else taunted Jesus three times about his identity? That's what the devil did, wasn't it? And here's Jesus at the, at the very beginning of his ministry, before he gets baptized in the wilderness, seeking God, being set apart for God and for this, for this mission. Before his baptism, Satan comes to him in his weakness and he tempts him. And here he is right at the end of his earthly ministry, on the cross, in utter weakness. It's the same temptation. If you are the Messiah, get off the cross. Why? Because messiahs don't die. That's what the Jews thought. Jesus didn't fit their box. He wouldn't dance to their tune. Now the Greeks, on the other hand, they, they, they're on this quest. They're not making demands. They're just searching. There's a lot of people just searching out there. The Greeks look for wisdom. And the problem with the Greeks is not that they desire wisdom. The problem is that they think that they are going to be the ones to find it. They presume that, that it's going to rationally make sense to them. That they will be able to bring all their faculties, all their thoughts, all their gleanings, all their learnings, and they'll be able to piece it together. And they'll say, aha, I figured it out. How many people have said, aha, I figured it out? Who was here in Y2K? Anybody remember Y2K? I know I'm dating myself, right? Oh, man. Whoa. We made it, guys. <laughs> Woo. Wow. How much ink has been spilled by people saying, I figured it out? How many blogs have been posted? How many books have been written? How many things have been sold, merchandise? How many conferences have been filled by people who've said, I know everyone's looking for wisdom, and guess what, guys? I'm the one that found it. 
But you see, Jesus doesn't appear like wisdom. Why? Because wisdom isn't for weak people. Wisdom isn't about love. Wisdom isn't about giving of yourself, they say. Wisdom isn't about sacrifice. Wisdom, is, wisdom isn't about self-forgetfulness. No, wisdom is about self. Wisdom is about coming into the full understanding and appreciation of who you are. Wisdom is about learning how to cope with your weaknesses so that you don't have any anymore. That's what wisdom is, the world says. And so Jesus looks like a tragic fool. Those are some nice ideas, man, but you really got yourself killed for it. People who are perishing, that's what they do with Jesus. Verse 24, but to those whom God has called, to the ones that God has summoned, Christ is not folly. <laughs> he is the power of God and the wisdom of God. You say, what's going on here? How does this make any sense? It's as if all of humanity looked at everything that God had revealed and did, and they, they, there's this, the revelation of Jesus Christ in Paul's day, and they said, you know what? This just doesn't fit. Let's put this over here. We know we don't need that piece. And now, let's get into the nitty-gritty of all that we can do. And then God came along and he said, you know what? Just to show you, just to show you how, how powerful I am, and just so you learn don't, not to rely on yourself, I'm going to take the thing that you threw away, and I'm going to use that to show my power. God says, I can take all your crooked sticks, and I can draw a straight line. Stephen, as you take your post, it's important that you remember that there is a real, a very real and a palpable impulse to lead the church through the wisdom of this age. Members, visitors, attenders, friends, you may think that you've stumbled upon it and you know how to fix what's going on at Coffs Harbor Baptist Church. And God may have given you that insight. But if it arises from the wisdom of this age, and it somehow bypasses the message of the cross, it's folly, and it's to be avoided. Hearing the message of the cross produces different results, the power of God, and then it sends others away. Seeking of the, wi the wisdom of this age is a temptation to be avoided. And I just want to pause for a moment and say, if you find yourself in that camp, and as I've described what people do with Jesus, that really resonated with you, and you're like, look, I'm looking for something, but, but I don't know what it is, and I'm kind of feeling like I'm at the end of my rope. Can I just tell you, the best thing you can do right now is, is just to stop, ask God, say, God, I've realized something. The pastor said to me this morning that I'm not going to arrive at salvation on my own ticket. I'm going to have to recognize something that you've done. And God, I want to hear your call today. If you're tired of seeking around and you feel tossed back and forth and you're just trying to discover the new fad after new fad after new fad, stop and ask God, God, would you summon me today? I want to hear your call today. Our last point, verses 16, excuse me, 26 to 31. Not only does the message of the cross produce different results, not only does the message of the cross run counter to the wisdom of this age, but the message of the cross facilitates our boasting in the wisdom of God. And here's where Paul's going to get really personal with the Corinthians. You know, he's been talking in very broad paintbrush strokes about how God's kingdom works and how God saves people and, and what instrument he uses to do that. He's talking very broad terms, but now he's going to land the plane. And this is what he says, brothers and sisters... Think about you when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. 
See, these Corinthians at the moment, are, they're getting fascinated with, with being on the cutting edge. They, 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 they want to they wanna make sure that they, they read everything Apollos writes and they have all his books on the shelf. And when they set up their Zoom call, they make sure they're strategically placed. You know, this is the Apollos shelf and this is the Peter shelf. And, and, and everything is just orchestrated around this cult of personality. But Paul says, remember how all this started. God spoke to you. You weren't wise, you weren't rich, many of you, and you weren't noble, many of you. Now, if you are wise or rich or noble, doesn't mean you can't be saved. I heard a guy give a testimony once. He said, my favorite word, the word I thank God for in all of Scripture is this word, many. I th think of it, not many of you, he says, because I, <laughs> I was one of the few, he said. So it doesn't mean you can't find God if you're rich or wise or noble. But the point was that this power of God was being unleashed in ordinary people. You don't need a, a Bible college degree to believe the message of the cross. You don't need to have a squeaky clean life. You don't need to, to pre-qualify like you'd pre-qualify for a mortgage or, or a rent or, or any sort of job interview. No, all you simply need to do is believe the message of the cross. And Paul says, hey guys, look around the room, everybody. Um, would anybody confuse you guys for the cream of the crop in Corinth? You know, if you're picking a... If you're picking a soccer team or a basketball team, you know, you guys are the ones that get picked at the end. Did that stop God from doing anything among you? Did you somehow get saved by your own cleverness? Or to rob a line that Paul used to the church in Galatia, having begun in the spirit, will you now finish by means of the flesh? No, of course not. Verse 27. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are. Oh my goodness, what hope are in these words. Has everybody written you off? There is still hope for you. God has his eyes on you. God says, I love to use people like you. Have you had people in your life turn to you and say, you know what? I can't anymore. I just can't with you. There's nothing you can do. I, 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 I'm done. God looks at you and he says, I love it when people nullify things. I love it when people say, you're useless. I understand some of you are, am I right that some of you are here as refugees of another country? Is that correct? Yeah. I mean, the world's basically said to you, we don't want you in your country. You've had to flee to survive. You know what God says? God says, please, please come into my country. Come into my kingdom. Let me show you what I can do. God has his eye on you. Conversely, some of us spend so much time scrubbing up trying to perfect our religious performance. You know, we learn the, the, we learn the latest fads and moves and what we say and you know we got the lingo the christianese down pat and and i i just see god looking around saying tell me when you're done i'm here i love you you're mine i'm ready to use you but i can't use you if you're constantly primping like just put the spiritual makeup down come partake of the message of the cross Wash yourself in my grace. Receive what I have given to you. Let me build the life out of that. Let me do something with that. It doesn't matter what everybody else is saying. You see, the only people who really have any problem with God doing that, and I know this because I have a temptation to be one of these people, the only people I know have a problem with that are the ones who say, you know, I kind of wanted to do it myself. You know, God, I have a lot of respect for you. God, I, I, I revere your word. And you know, I think if I work at it, I, I really think that, that I could become somebody that you would like to have on your team. 
just give me some time, God. Give me some time. Give me a few good books, you know. Give me a few mentors in my life. And God, I think if I do it, I, I, I really think you'll see me, you'll come to see me as an asset. Paul calls it for what it is. He says, if that's my mentality, if that's your mentality, you're trying to boast in yourself. And Paul tells them in no uncertain terms, the culmination of this, if you only remember one verse from this whole section, it's verse 30. Listen to what Paul is trying to say to them. It is because of him. Is that him, Apollos? No. Is it Peter? No. It's not Paul. He's, he, doesn't, he knows grammar. He's not using first person. It's God. It is because of God that you are in Christ Jesus. You're only saved because of God. Christ Jesus, who has become for us wisdom from God, that is our righteousness, our holiness, and redemption. And here, folks, let me tell you, this: uh, let the Spirit blow the doors off your heart and mind through what Paul has just said here. We started with the question, where do you find wisdom? God has answered it for us. He said, wisdom is in Jesus Christ, but he's more than just wisdom. He's more than just cleverness because the beauty and the, and the wisdom of Christ is that he has become these three things for us, our righteousness, our perfect standing before God. He has become our, what's next? Holiness. Our sacredness, being set apart for God. And he has become our redemption. Therefore, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. Oh, goodness. What a church this would be. What a church this would be if whenever you came through the doors on Sunday... People filled this room with stories of the greatness of God. And I'm not talking like those sort of backhanded stories of the greatness of God. You know, the ones that sort of start with, I was at a low. And I decided I really needed to do something about that. And you go into this long story about how you know, you just agonized over it long enough and you thought and prayed and you got into this particular prayer position and, you know, and you grabbed this oil from the cupboard and you, and you, and you did all these things and, 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 you know, after that, God showed up. What have you just said? Exactly. It's about you. Can I tell you, there is so much freedom in the church and, the, and there's so much fresh air to walk into a room of people who are not posturing, who are not posing, who, are half, who understand that they are weak and they don't have it in themselves, but to know that they said, I am saved because God has summoned me and called me and that's who I am. What a place Coffs Harbor Baptist Church would be if that was your mentality. Stephen, the best thing that you can do for these people is to show them Christ. Church. From time to time, parishioners are tempted to, to not support the pastor. Sometimes for good reason. But I want to encourage you, if you feel that temptation and you feel that impulse, and you, 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 you know, whether it's now or whether it's six months, six years, 25 years down the track, you feel that impulse. I want you to remember this right now. If you feel that impulse to not support Stephen or his family or his ministry, the first thing you need to do is to ask why. What is my reason? And be honest with yourself for that. Because if Christ is still central... If the message of the cross is still being proclaimed and lived out and, and ministered, don't get in the way of that. Sure, you might do it differently. Sure, he could probably do it better. But know that the power of God is coming through the message of the cross. And finally, if you see your pastor struggling, and I say this as a pastor who's had a rough 12 months, the best thing you can do for them is to remind your pastor that they already have Christ 
who will be and who is for them, for him. Wisdom and power from God. That is the best thing you can do. Let us boast in the Lord. Christ is our wisdom, our righteousness, our holiness. He is our boast. He is our status. He is our confidence. He is our peace. He is our master. He is our teacher. He is our power. He's our nobility. He's our privilege. He's the true shepherd. He's our pastor. He's our savior. He's our king. Jesus Christ is our first love, our glorious inheritance, our Passover lamb, our new Adam, our death slayer, our sin eater, our life giver, our elder brother, our beloved husband, our betrothed, our bridegroom, our risen Lord. And we will go on forever and ever. Let us pray. Jesus, to know you is everything. And so, Lord, I pray that you would be manifest here in this church. I pray that this church would be spared from promoting a cult of personality. Lord, that the gifts that you give, even though they're so great and abundant, Lord, that they wouldn't be prized above the giver. Lord, I pray for your covering of protection. In a hostile world, Lord, in a world that doesn't know you, that this place would be an incubator of righteousness and that true spirituality would come forth Men and women full of the Spirit singing songs and hymns and spiritual songs and bringing praises to God. Each one stewarding the gift of grace that they've been given as you've apportioned it, Jesus. For we know that then, then will this church attain to the unity and the fullness. That then will they grow up into the head that is Christ. Lord, we're nothing without you. Thank you for being our strength, our power, and our wisdom. Now give us your peace. Amen. I believe we're going to have another song. Thank you for indulging me. I know it's been a long day. I know some of you are hot. Come on back. Is that right? Am I right? Do we have another song? Is that right? Or are we done? That's correct. Okay, good. All right. Thank you again uh, for having me here and allowing me to share this platform. Thanks. <laughs>